what do you think we can do? There's, there's just endless ideas. So the future is exciting when it comes to technology, I think. Afternoon, I'm uh, Russ Borum. I'm a strategic account director at Automation Anywhere. Um, I've been with Automation Anywhere about four years and I look after the uh, commercial relationship with the NHS. I have the, uh, the pleasure of introducing uh, Tremaine Richard Noel this afternoon. Tremaine is head of emerging technology at Northampton General Hospital. He's also portfolio director for the Automation Accelerator, their center of excellence for RPA and automation technology. Um, Tremaine, firstly, um, could you just tell us a little bit about what, what is a head of emerging technology in the, in the NHS? What is it that you're, you're doing with Northampton? Yeah, so I have a fairly unusual title, <laughs> fair to say. Um, so we look after RPA across, um, especially with Automation Anywhere, across a number of trusts. So at the moment we're working with about 50 or 60 uh, trusts across the country, helping them adopt RPA at scale. So we know that it, it's, it's a tool that lots of different organisations are trying to do and we're, we're achieving sort of great efficiencies by bringing that and, and supporting a number of organisations. So we've got a team of about, it's growing quite quickly, so there's about 40 of us now. Um, and growing the number of organisations we're, work, we're working with and deploying this at scale to you know, make, make our staff support them with being more efficient to spend more time on, on care and those sorts of things and removing admin tasks. Brilliant. Fantastic, thank you. So we're going to talk today uh, about cloud automation, of course, um, and also about how you took a prototype project and it's blossomed into what is now the most sophisticated automation project in the NHS, which is fantastic. Um, I just want to rewind slightly, a couple of years, I think it was March 2020, um, I remember it being a Thursday night and I don't remember why I remember that, but you phoned me uh, one night and you said, um, Russ, I've got an idea, we'd been talking about automation a little bit, um, and he said, I think I've got an idea of what RPA could help us with, can we have a chat, do you mind jumping on the phone and uh, we'll have a chat with my C CIO um, and we'll just talk through and see if this is feasible, right? So I grabbed Michael, one of our solution engineers at, at, um, on the project, and we had a chat. We walked through what the idea was. So the, I don't want to steal your funder too much, but the idea effectively was that we were going to track and monitor oxygen reporting. Um, tell us a little bit about why, why did you pick that? What was going on in the NHS at the time? Yeah, so at the time, there was, the only way to describe it was I was sitting in a, what felt like a situation room um, with loads of screens about, and one of the, challenges as you said was trying to uh, monitor well what we'd seen in other trusts is that um, they'd had to declare incidents because they'd been using their oxygen tanks to a level that was just unprecedented so we didn't want to encounter issues so it, there was a ask for someone to log into a system sort of twice every hour 24 7 um, and and there wasn't too many people jumping to, to take that well um, so I called you in and actually this is definitely a case for automation and there are other you know for us one of the key things was there was no time so it was an ask for doing this immediately um, and I knew that we could get this spun up um, up and running pretty quickly um, so that's what we did um, worked pretty hard to get something up and running um, and we did that within within hours which was which, which was really important and it, it, it sort of start was the start of our journey with, with RBA which was um, exciting and I think it was it was about 12 hours from when we had that initial call to having the first prototype up and running. What did that mean? What, what was the, the kind of perception of the trust at the time when they saw how quickly you could start building these things out? The reaction was really positive. I think one of the things that I reflected on and why we were successful beyond this is because everyone could see us building this. So rarely do you get a chance to sit around your board and actually build an automation. So it was kind of um, a chance to, to see actually we had a problem um, and before you sort of knew it, um, there was a solution to it. So you know, we built on it. It wasn't perfect the first time round, um, but we kept building, kept iterating until we got to that point where it was, uh, it, it just continues working. So. Brilliant. Okay, so fast forward, it was about a year, I think. You'd started building out other processes. You'd had a, f a few things going live. The program was gaining quite a bit of traction. Um, because of your guidance to the NHS, you were selected to be a Forbes 30 under 30. Congratulations again. Um, what's that experience like? Because it's been a bit of a whirlwind journey, hasn't it? Um, there hasn't been much time to reflect. It's just been responding to the, the situations that unfolded. What we've found is that this has now gone from dealing with the crisis to dealing with the aftermath in the sense that 
now we've got a, a really large backlog of patients. There's a lot of admin to maintain there and to, to work through. Um, and automation is now being um, heavily invested in. So when I started this, it was you know, only in March 2020. Um, it was relatively new to the NHS, a few organisations really using it to it now being you know, hundreds of millions of pounds, not fully just in RPA, but being invested in technology to help recover from, from, the, from COVID. Um, so it's a completely different environment trying to use automation now to then, um, and a lot more awareness around, um, and also just a realisation that we, we are human. The thing we trade on in the NHS is you know, delivering care, um, not being really good admin, you know, doctors are not known for their great handwriting and so on, right? So, um, you know, helping people focus on, this, on their skills is what we've really you know, honed in on and focused on. You touched on the, the investment that's coming around the programme. I, I want to pick up on that in a second. But first, I wanted to ask you, um, with the work that you were doing, you've, you're working with a broad array of stakeholders, technical, non-technical, clinical, um, people that were really in the forefront of the pandemic. Was that a smooth ride? Did you, did you meet resistance along the way? What, what was it like convincing people this was the right thing to do? Um, well, when you, it, it's the, the best analogy I'd use is if you go up to someone with sort of 200,000 piles of paper and go, I've got something that will help. It was fairly re fe well received. So we didn't have too much pushback across clinical staff and others. I think naturally the challenges have been around the organisation understanding what is an automation going to do, what's the governance around this. Um, there's been talk of, you know, can it break out of the server room and cause destruction? It's like, no, that's not what an automation is. So there's a lot of education around pros and cons, what it does, what it doesn't do. So that's kind of where the pushback's been, um, in more just people understanding the, the scale of this and what it can do. And also when you say to someone, um, they ask, what can this tool do? And you can always go, well, we can automate anything. Um, as long as it's logical, has clear steps and so on. It's kind of a, that just, uh, sometimes you end up creating more questions than answers. So there was a lot of that in education, but that's one of the things we've worked on in the programme is giving the tools to any CIO or um, you know, infrastructure lead on what is automation, what's the best process to go through. So we do a lot of sort of, not so much policy setting, but like best practice um, gu and guidance to other organisations in the NHS. And well, was that always part of your strategy to, to build something show the success and then educate people on what they could do and, and kind of build that wider support across the trust or did it did it happen more organically than that? So it sort of happens organically. Um, I started thinking we'll have a small team and build a few automations and then we suddenly had 50 trusts and <laughs> lots of you know big team and doing great work all across the country so I think it, it accelerated really rapidly um, so it, it did initially it was quite organic in the sense that we talk about automation um, and always it became a rumor so <laughs> what would happen is you'd get nurses calling up going like I hear you've got something that makes life easier or can automate this and, and so on so it, you, people start hearing as soon as you, they, they, you start hearing departments that have got automation that's really working for them um, other people come and then it's just gone it's just organically the word spread across the organization really so. and you've um, you've alluded to this program that's now touching 50 something trusts um, and that's incredible um, I think the biggest program in the NHS that's doing this kind of work um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about where that came from and, and I know there's some central stakeholders involved in that so I'm sure people would love to hear a bit more about it. Yeah, so it initially started as a pilot. Um, so there were two centres of excellence um, that were piloted in the NHS to look at automation with the idea being that actually can, can organisations within the NHS help each other rather than it almost coming from a top-down approach. So we started um, working with a small number of trusts, I think 12 initially, and building out automations, finding the usability, finding the best way to deploy, and counting all the challenges. And then from that, um, after you know, a few, I think it was October last year, there was a funding announcement um, around technology to help recover from COVID. And we then um, put in a bid to expand this across the whole region, and the region being sort of bought every organisation within the Midlands, of it. so you know, GPs, mental health trusts, you know, all, all of them. So the, the idea, what we've done is provide licensing for those organisations so that one of the key things with all technologies is transferability. So what we didn't want is um, lots of funding to happen across different organisations, build loads of automations on different platforms that can't be shared. So we licensed the whole of the Midlands 
and now we're, we're building automations that can be used across all of those hospitals. So in total, you know, there's 200,000 staff across that patch, um, and the, pop the patient population is the size of Switzerland, just in the Midlands alone. So the, the scale is pretty phenomenal, um, but it's important in terms of doing this at a, uh, both being cost efficient, um, spreading best practice, making it easier for organizations. So we're doing a lot of you know, coaching, training, and the idea being that we leave the, the Midlands with a capability, not just platform, but uh, individuals who are trained in building their own automation. So if we, out of those organizations, every, every organization just built 10 or 20 across the next year, suddenly got hundreds that are reusable across the whole NHS. So we've got lots of similar systems, not always, but there's lots of reusability. Um, so the, the potential is massive. I know, I know you've got some pretty big plans for training both technical and non-technical staff on this journey, so we can dig into that in a bit more, but I think one of the things that always impresses me is knowing what the end goal, you know, what we're aiming for. So in your words, what, what do you think um, in terms of benefits and outcomes that the NHS is striving for? How is this program helping you to get to where you need to be? So I think one of the things we've spoken about previously is when we've looked at um, the potential with this program. So one of the key things, I and mean, probably most people have experienced this, is when, when you go to a GP, you, they make a referral into, into the secondary care. It sometimes takes a, a while. Um, and on the other end, um, just me, <laughs> candid, it's not always the most organised of process. Um, so we, we've done some analysis around actually if you build an automation that supports with that, um, and deployed that across the whole NHS, um, it'd give back over 2,040 uh, effectively people's worth of time back. So, you know, freeing up that time from clinicians. So there's, I think for us, it's yes, there's lots of exciting stuff we can do in just the region, but there's certain use cases where you see actually every clinician in the country is doing this. Um, there's lots of paper, um, lots of, um, you know, no, no, lots of this people haven't actually turned over the stone, turn, turned the stone over and looked under it. So as someone I, I hadn't always worked in the NHS, a lot of the stuff I look at and I'm like, you're doing what? Um, so there's a lot of repeat, you know, the, the worst processes I've seen are where you submit something you know, to get access to the trust, you submit a, a, a form online, um, then you print that form out, you scan it back in, they type it, they then print it out, someone else then types it back in and approves it, um, and then prints it for records. So you end up with like repeat, 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 repeat. So you can see where, and the only reason that's happened is because no one's looked at end to end. So a lot of what we find as benefits are not actually the automation itself, but just uncovering and going, did you know you do it like this? Um, so the team do quite a lot of work around process, um, not just looking at the automation itself. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> I think that's a really important point. So rather than just building your automations, what you're actually uncovering is this whole wealth of opportunity, right? So regardless of the technology, you can then go on and start tackling some of those things. And I know the Automation Accelerator has 20 something technologies that you work with. Um, how important was it when you started spinning this up that you started thinking about scaling this and, and the infrastructure and the cloud and everything that came behind it? Um, so I think, if I'm, if I'm honest, at the beginning, you don't think, we're just very much thinking patience, patience, how do we make staff <laughs> better? Uh, and then and then there is the realization as it scales around okay how do we do this in the easiest best practice and that sort of thing so a lot of i think at the beginning the consideration was more sort of how do we enable one organization at a time and get them to do it properly now we're taking off sort of a chunk of 50 organizations that the conversation is much more you know granular and there's a lot of detail in that and the team has grown around to support that um, so we've kind of gone through different stages and now we're in a stage where it's almost like someone said it the other day around, it's almost like going from seed funding to series A in, as an organization. And what we're doing is we had a small team looking at relatively small number of organizations now really growing out and the complexity has increased with that. Um, but the benefits are also much bigger as well in terms of the organizations we reach. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the program itself continues and there's a you know two, three year roadmap that you're working through. Um, within that roadmap, uh, what else are you thinking about in terms of next step? What, what does the future look like for you? Because there's, there's so much you could potentially go after, right? Where, where do you draw a line? So I think um, for me, it's, it's an interesting one because RPA is like, it's, it's something that will continue to underpin what we do. What excites me is how it comes together with other technologies. So some of the things we've been looking at around machine learning 
um, and other elements of AI are really fascinating. So you know, by being able, where I'd love the NHS to be in a sort of hypothesis is that you almost, by tracking you know, patients in the community with wearable devices, we all have, now you almost see everyone with a you know, watch, um, it'd be great to use all that data to almost predict who's going to be in A&E, so almost the hospital knows before you do. Not that it sounds a bit apocalyptic. Um, but it's that level of that that level of uh, intelligence that is out there that we can then combine with, um, with with automation. So as an example, when someone one of the things we're looking at at the moment is with our triage lists, can we go through all of the waiting lists, taking all the data, and work out is anyone you know deteriorating? Can we use? There's so many patients that sometimes yes, there's lots of people looking at it, but using big data and analysis and combining that with RPA to make it easier to take actions when you've decided, okay, that patient needs to come in, let's run that automation to book them in. It's, it's pooling all of these things together. Um, so I think when I sat with clinicians and said, look, these, this is the armory, um, what do you think we can do? There's, there's just endless ideas. So the, the future is exciting when it comes to technology, I think. I think yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think the, the future is almost getting to a point where you're unlimited in the, in the ideas, right? And that can, that can be both a, a pro and a con. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of people thinking about RPA and how to get started. Is there, is there any advice that you would give to somebody who's just kicking off a program? Anything that would help make it a little bit easier for them? Yeah, I think um, I reflect on, I, it might sound like a bit of a tangent, but I used to have a, I, was, I used to play the tuba and a conductor always said, D stop dipping your toes in the bath water. So, you know, just go full on and, and get, it, get it done. And I think that's almost something that I'd advise other organizations. So a lot of people go, um, let's just build one automation or two automations to start. When it's, it, you might as well just start meaningfully win a department, automate as much as you can, see what learnings you have, and then uh, expand beyond there. Um, so for us, that's what we've done. We've learned in terms of what goes wrong, in terms of governance, and um, what, what, and also educating people around, um, in, in especially in a clinical environment, you can imagine there's a lot of fear around what, what, what's the worst that can happen, so educating around that and working through that process as well. So it's almost like working out all of the speed bumps and you only do that by sort of tackling a big chunk of automation and then rolling it out across the organisation beyond there. Um, uh, the other advice would be to kind of work with um, excitable people, not departments. So I tend to not sort of go, okay, HR, we know there's loads of things that can be automated, but if the HR director is not interested in automation, absolutely pointless. Um, so I, I've really been reactive. So we, uh, one of our great use cases has been the oncology team who have actually, I saw, saw what we're doing on LinkedIn, reached out and said, ah, we'd love that, we'd love that. So there's loads of things we're looking at there. And that's kind of example is the most engagement have, has been and success has been with those who kind of came forward. Um, so, and, and that's been a success of the program that this is something we've done with people, not sort of to them. So if we knock on the door and go, do you want something to be automated? And go, no, we're going to be like, okay, we've got enough people who are, you know, with 200,000 staff, you can be picky. Um, so um, that's, that's, that's how we've gone about it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time to share the experience. Um, it's always a pleasure, as you know, but we love being your partner in the journey. So thank you for trusting in Automation Anywhere.